Expect the best used car deals guaranteed. Visit arnoldclark.com. Welcome to Peter and Ruffy's Football Show, sponsored by Arnold Clark. It's Thursday, 21st of May. Alan Ruff, Tam Cowan and Hugh McDonald are with me here on the show. We're delighted to have your company. Thank you very much for joining us. There is lots to talk about. And, of course, Fluffy the dog joins us as well, although that's not her name. What is her name, Tam? Uh, his, his name is Caspar, and he does know the difference between Donald and Douglas Park. <laughs> so, <laughs> so there you are. So, so Casper is now. We've now pushed the technology. We've got four men and a dog queue on the program. <laughs> did, did Jonathan? Did Jonathan Ross know have a similar act? What am I thinking? <laughs> <laughs> yes, he did. Uh, Casper looks fantastic. Well, I, want, uh, I want to know what, where is your hand? Your hand, all right? Is it just <laughs> <laughs> Ruffy having that a go is... at somebody else for giving his horn up a dug? <laughs> 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 I don't know. I don't know if there's any point in actually highlighting what we're going to talk about uh -huh. here with that one. No. Nevertheless, uh -huh. yeah. lots of football to talk about, and of course, the other thing about it is, you know, I don't know if you've witnessed this more, more so, you know, the guys when you look at the dates. Every date now, because we're in this lockdown, <laughs> has got some significance with yesteryear. <laughs> People are getting yep. so nostalgic, Tom. It's amazing. I was actually doing an interview with our uh, mutual friend uh, today, Mr. Graham Spears, uh, for his uh, newspaper article tomorrow on Helicopter Sunday, uh, which was 15 years ago. And I think Huey and Ruffy and yourself, Peter, will agree. The anniversaries, we were, they, they, some of them were getting a wee bit tiresome when they weren't a kind of a round number, a classic anniversary date. But mm. old Helicopter Sunday... I still remember your dulcet tones uh, from that day, Peter, and I uh, heard it long, long after. Uh, well done in you to even stay so excited when you were clearly being sick in a, a basin. Um, but uh, <laughs> it was indeed 15 years ago, and that's the sort of anniversary you should celebrate. But joy of joys, joy of joys, and I won't even say the name of the broadcaster, Peter, uh, but this weekend, with all the nostalgia stuff, we're able to watch the full Scotland Holland game. We normally only see we Archie Gemmell's goal, and sadly for the big man there, we see uh, Johnny Rep putting one past him. But we can enjoy that full game tomorrow night, and then Gordon Strachan's finest moment in a Scotland jersey, try to get his foot up in the advertising board um, against West Germany in '86. So great stuff! I'm loving the nostalgia. Yeah, absolutely, and uh, God, it's hard to believe, Hugh. Most of the people uh, that I spent many of my great school years uh, with disowned me after the helicopter Sunday commentary. <laughs> they, 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 they were not <sighs> happy at all. Uh, 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 yeah. <laughs> it, became a, it, became, it became a ringtone, didn't it? It became a ringtone oh. amongst uh, a certain... A certain um, uh, I, was, I was actually on a cruise at the time, would you believe? I was on a cruise in the Mediterranean at the time. Uh, so, uh, and it's one of these, one of these great things about Scottish football. You could, I think, I was walking about Villefranche, and this guy came up to me who I'd never seen before, and just leaned over and said to me, "Celtic are one nothing up, right?" And I don't thank you very much. And I was walking back down to get the the the, the B boat and the jetty back to the, uh, the the ship, and this other guy moseyed over and he said, "That's Celtic blowing the league." You know, so it just shows you that no uh, matter where you are in the world, there's somebody, uh, there's somebody concerned about Scottish football and willing to keep you up to date. It was it was bonkers as well, Peter. You know, it was always pretty poor about it. And you're all backing in this one. It was as if, in the eyes of the Celtic fans that day, that Motherwell weren't meant to enjoy, <laughs> savour a victory against one half of the old firm. It was as if we were meant uh, to be gutted for them. Now, I'll remind you as well, we, we, were, we were still in administration. Whereas, you know, we had guys like Jerry Britton, they hadn't a Jerry, but Jerry came on as a sub for us. Jerry was done, mm. you know. And we had uh, a team that was kind of scratched together. Celtic had all the 30 grand a week guys like Larson and Hartson and Sutton. And, you know, for Chris Sutton, who once famously um, 
declared that uh, Dunfermline had laid down against Rangers. I'd have to say to Chris that Celtic absolutely bottled it at Fir Park. It was nobody's fault apart from the rain. It was a, it was a remarkable day, and I was as I, rem I was reminded when I was chatting to Spears about it for his newspaper. The memories came flooding back. The email that I received a week or so later for a Celtic fan which had every profanity in the book, <laughs> uh, times uh -huh. 10. And what had happened was it was a classic game of Chinese whispers. The guy was basically accusing me of going on the radio the Saturday after that game mm -hmm. and saying that David Murray, David Murray had sent me, Tam Cowan, a case of wine to say thank you. Now, what had happened, of course, and you may remember this, I had gone on the radio and mentioned that David Murray had sent Terry Butcher a case of wine to say thank you. The then Motherwell manager, his ex-captain at Rangers, and a man who enjoyed a, a glass of vintage wine. But this was a classic Chinese whispers. The guy had it in his head because I'd told the story in the radio that it was me who was the recipient of the wine. So you can guess the content uh, of his email and who he may have guessed I supported that particular period in my life. Outrageous. I'm so, well, all I can say, Tom, is I'm sorry for that. I've apologised over the years <laughs> for it. I think, I think now, I think now in the Scottish football, we should move on. Exactly, hey, Huey, yeah. Huey. I know it wasn't a year because it was 2005, and it was an email. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Like Craig Bell, Craig Bellamy was in that Celtic side. Oh, I know. I mean, that was. Uh, if you look back at that Celtic side as well, Tam makes a great point about uh, the the actual class of that Celtic side. I mean, that Celtic side was packed, full of players who, not long before, of course, are, are, uh, sort of had. Well, in fact, that season had had, had, had been yeah. brilliant in yeah. Europe. Um, so, I I mean, just one. One of these things, I always, always uh, have that chortle about the fact that, you know, we Scott McDonald used to get it. I used to talk to Scott, and Scott obviously celebrated his goals, as he's absolutely entitled to do. You know, he's playing for a club and he, and he, and he wins the game from him. And he said, people down the years still don't forgive him for scoring goals for the, the guys that pay them his own wages. So it's a strange old world. It's a strange old and then, world. The, the remarkable thing, Huey, was Scott McDonald. I mean, he was clearly the antichrist in the eyes of the Celtic uh, uh, fans uh, that day at Fir Park. And then a year later... He joined Celtic, and there's still some rumblings, of course, from Celtic fans um, a wee bit. Uh, uh, no, no, quite like when Rangers signed Mo Johnston, but but no, no, a million miles away from it. And then, of course, he, he joined Celtic, and then two months later, he scores a hat trick against Motherwell um, at uh, Parkhead. You know, and talk about leveling things out. And then he goes on to be—I don't know the actual stats, but he went on to be a Champions League goal scorer for Celtic, a brilliant player yeah. who, who who always gave you 100 percent. For whichever <coughs> club he was playing for. Yeah, uh, Dale, Mar right. Dale Martin says, mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely, says Casper. Um, Dale Martin says, was the wine nice, Tam? Uh, so cle <laughs> clearly people are reacting to it all. Neil Jameson says, Helicopter Sunday was terrific. He enjoyed it immensely. Uh, and Darren Fields, who's in New York, said that was just a horrible day. It just gives you an indication of all the memories that come flooding back. Although, uh, it, we must have done something right, uh, Ruffy, because uh, I think David Murray actually phoned Radio Clyde and said, can we have uh, Peter's commentary uh, for the start of the season when we're unfurling the flag? And I can just remember uh, 50,000 Rangers fans and Derek Johnson saying, here's your commentary, Peter. This is absolutely magnificent. And they unfurled the, the, the championship flag, Ruffy. Wow. Well, uh, well, I didn't know that. Uh, that's a tremendous gesture, you know, and uh, yes. obviously I'll live in a lot of people's <laughs> memory that day. Uh, but yep, Tam's absolutely. Just, that, Tam's just ruined my weekend, telling me that Scotland Holland game's on tomorrow night. <laughs> well, we're about to we're, we, we are, we're about to find out how you managed to lose a goal yeah. from thirty five yeah, yards, yeah. and whether have, Archie Gemmell got a touch on it. Yeah, have a look at it. Class, the two things you've got to look at closely. You know, was there a deflection on the way? And the Holland first goal was never a penalty. Stuart Kennedy never even touched him. Uh, it was just a clash of two people together, but the referee had a horrendous game. But see, if, see when you watch it, Sam, I'm 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 hadn't a guess. In the first 45 minutes, we could have been four, four one up. 
Are they? Aye. Aye. Four were Bruce, say you Bruce, Rio, Bruce Rio hit the post to six yards with a header. Kenny had a chance. There was another one as well. It was amazing. You said yeah, I don't know if you noticed there. Friday night. Why, do, why don't also, as well as wasting your Friday night, waste uh, your after dinner act as well, right? Be telling you that just the other night I went to the pub with Casper. Right, and the guy says, <laughs> yeah. you can't come in here with a duck. And I says, hey, hey this is a talking dog. He says, what? I says, hey, it's a talking dog. And I says, he says, show me then. And I says, hey, well, I says, right, Casper. I says, if I'm... <laughs> oh, he's froze. <laughs> he's froze. He's <laughs> froze. Uh, when, no, he's where, back. Where, he's where, back. where does it land? Where does it land? And he says, rough. And the guy says, oh, you get out. You get out. Like, no, no date for you, Russell. It's okay. Thanks, <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, nice, nice I honestly thought, Ruffy, you'd sabotage his broadcast. There just to so did I. Do your gag. Uh, I don't know if you know this, uh, Tom, but while you were chatting there, uh, Casper just went like this. And I was waiting on him turning around, Hugh, and going like that. <laughs> It looks like Bob Carroll. Bob Carroll. Bob Carroll. Talking to lookalikes, he nearly lunged at the screen there because he thought Peter was bagpuss. <laughs> By the way, I, I actually had a running order for this program. I don't know why I'm bothered. Ah, <laughs> I uh, a, a couple of things I was going to say to you. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Tom. I mean, it's it's days that people are starting to look back on, and that took us on a wee mazy there. Um, and the other thing I was going to say to you is Peter Tierney's just said, I remember that day, he says, Tony Mowbray told his team not to come over the halfway line in the second half. Uh, I mean, if you if you listen back to people recalling what was happening at Easter Road, mm. Rangers did you know, they probably had believed just a wee bit that they were going to win the league, but once it all became apparent and unfolded, um, why would you even bother to, to head over the halfway line? Anyway, the reason I'm mentioning the 21st of May is because our special guest is James Keatings, who was ah. playing for Hibs at the time. He was at Hamden on the 21st of May, 2016. It's a day that will live long in the memory of Hibbies all over the world, Ruffy, because that was the day they ended 114 years of pain for the Scottish Cup final. Yeah, it was absolutely, it's a long, long time. and There's a lot of guys that go along with that. You know, it's, a, it's been a long time since the club's had to deal with that stat, you know, year on year. So it's always fantastic. <laughs> just to get it off your back uh, and move on, and, and that's what they did. Yeah, Peter, what, what happened, though, what happened, Peter, though, is, is that, you know, your commentary for the helicopter Sunday became famous. What happened after 2016, of course, is that my commentary from 1902 was dumped, you know, it was rendered absolutely yes. irrelevant, so it was a kind of, kind of big day for me as well. Yeah, of course, that was the standing gag cue. Geronimo was still alive the oh, last yep. time Hibs won the <laughs> Scottish Cup. And that oh, one was uh, killed. And he actually genuinely was still alive in uh, 1902 uh, until Hibs eventually just got rid of all those gags. Another great thing about it, Tam, which I think you have been privy to, and this is why I love um, you know days when other clubs get those special memories, Hibs get the chance to go down Leith with the cup on the bus, the open top bus. These are days that your kids never forget. You had it with Motherwell. Absolutely. I mean, I always go back to Peter. I've told you many a time before, David Cooper says that was his highlight. He Mother won the cup, was getting a wee shot in an open top bus because he hadn't been <laughs> able to do that with all the, the trophies he'd won uh, with Rangers. And the Hibs fans obviously absolutely relished that uh, that particular day. And that's the only time I've, I've had a long-held kind of belief and it's uh, caused me getting involved in some heated arguments from time to time with Hibs fans. Uh, when I say that the only thing that spoiled it for me that day when they won the cup against Rangers uh, was uh, the fans invading the pitch because they'd waited all those years, 114 years to see their team win the cup and they didn't get the kind of proper presentation because of everything that happened after it. And I wasn't for a minute, as a fan of a wee diddy club myself, I wasn't for a minute saying that the Habs fans shouldn't enjoy it. But for my heart of hearts, I put myself in the shoes of if Motherwell, as a Motherwell fan, if I'd waited that long to see my team winning the cup, and then when we finally did it in 91, if everybody had run onto the park and it had kind of ruined the spectacle at the end, I would have been absolutely raging. So I wasn't, if anything, I was backing. 
uh, the Hibs fans were at. But to this day, I mean, there was a, a few of my Hibs uh, supporting pals got in contact uh, today, <coughs> and they reminded me of that again, you know. And but you know, they're sensible enough to know that I, it was from the heart, and I was meaning it for the good of Hibs. And not, the other wee thing that I'll, I'll chuck into the mix, Peter, maybe for everybody that's getting in contact with the show on Facebook, they could start a wee debate here. Uh, when my pals did send me some of their clips for the cup final, Hibs Rangers, um, when the Proclaimers, Sunshine, Sunshine and Leith, was playing over the Tannoy at the end of the game, I would argue to Huey, Ruffy and yourself, Peter, that Sunshine and Leith is maybe the only tune from another club, cl club that you don't support, that can still give you the goosebumps when you hear it. I can't think of any other examples of that. It just really gets you. It's amazing. Yeah. Liverpool? Absolutely, Tom. No, uh, absolutely. Absolutely. See, I, I, I remember not just 216, I think 27, was it, Peter, when they won the League Cup in the snow, the snow flecking uh, John Collins' team. What a Hibs team that was when you look back at it as well, you know, with uh, Brown and Whitaker and uh, Fletcher and Muzzelin and uh, all these guys. And I remember the end of that <laughs> game. The the which they won uh, easily beat Command at five one uh, brilliant performance. Sunshine and Leith was started almost spontaneously as I was uh, clattering my wittering rubbish, and I always remember looking up to it and saying, "That <coughs> is really, that is really moving. That is really, um, mm -hmm. you know." When Tam just used an expression from the heart, uh, you could you could feel it definitely from the heart that day. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, we'll get to James Keating I'll just say very shortly. Yeah, I was going to say, unfortunately, when we won the Cup in 71, I don't think we had a bus. You know, I don't think anybody thought we were going to win it, so I think we were just to make our end with him. Uh, and they had to get a bus. <laughs> and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, a wee single, a wee single deck, a bus turned up. And of course, we all got on the bus with the Cup. And somebody says, how can we show the supporters? So we had to break the skyline in the bus, and uh, if you ever get a chance to see the forties, there's about five is all sticking, sticking my heads out this we air vent in the top of this single end bus. Uh, it was just <laughs> one of these. I mean, nobody ever imagined that we get a bus. To tell you the truth, yeah. Is it is it An just me? By the way, can we get a can we get so, a full shot of him? Or is it just me? Or today does Ruffy look like a dentist? Oh, he's changed his background <laughs> and everything, Tom. Yeah. Honestly. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Shirt or something. You look like a dentist. The, the whole thing there is he's, he's yeah. moved his background to make it a softer approach for Ruffy with the, mm -hmm. with the couch there. The only thing missing, really, to be honest with you, is Jess Yates just sitting next to him, Tom. <laughs> <telling his> own, <laughs> what him we're going to be listening to. Uh, yeah, the other Kasper, thing Casper well. just said to me there, sorry, Casper just said, did I get that wrong? Was it Jim Lee? Is it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, only Ruffy Naughty knows boy. why you're getting Naughty that boy. Guy. Naughty <laughs> boy. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, anyway, uh, James Keatings is indeed uh, coming up. Just out of curiosity, um, you know, you mentioned there about 5 1, but look at the Hibs scored early in this game. Look at the team that Hibs had out for that. I mean, you're talking about good loan signings. You know, uh, 3 5 2, McGregor, Hanlon, and Fontaine. And then it was Gray, 5 A, McGeoch, McGinn, Stevenson. Uh, and then, of course, Stokes and Cummings up front. And Hugh, it's amazing to think about it, but Stokes had scored after three minutes. Yeah, it was a remarkable game. It was one of these games, there's a great novel about Scottish football, probably the greatest novel about Scottish football called Thistle and the Grain, the, uh, the Holy uh, Thistle and the Holy Grail. Uh, and it's it's about the sort of romance of cups, and I can be a bit sceptical about the romance of cups. I always think some cups are as romantic as a as an assignation up a close, but and and in, in this case, this was a really romantic cup final. And that, that even if you go back to the the Hibs goalkeeper uh, Logan and goal, what a story what that was. Uh, and then if you go right through the team, Stokes uh, with all his ups and downs in his career. Then, of course, the subbies as well. Liam Henderson coming on and, and absolutely changing the game, uh, Peter. So it was, a, it was a remarkable cup final. Yeah, absolutely. We'll hear from uh, James Keating, who also came on as a substitute in that match and then, obviously, uh, will forever be remembered along with all the other players who played their part in that memorable 3-2 win, including, of course, the captain. We had him on the show. It's hard to believe, guys. We had David Gray on the show about 
maybe nine weeks ago now in lockdown. So that just mm. tells you how long we've been, uh, you know, persevering with this and hopefully people are enjoying it. Thanks to the thousands upon thousands of people who've been following us and liking, sharing and following on Facebook and, of course, subscribing on YouTube. Uh, I must just point out at this uh, juncture in the programme that Nicola Sturgeon, the First Minister, has been highlighting the gradual <laughs> easing of the lockdown that will be coming up over the next week or two, which uh, I think the SPFL certainly would like to give most of the clubs, if not all, the go-ahead to try and get them back to some sort of training, Ruffy. But uh, I think it's st we've still got a bit to go, but by next week there could be a slight easing, and, and then June 10th I think they're hoping to get players training. Yeah, but there'll be guidelines, you know, they'll definitely, we'll sort what's happened in Germany, uh, how the, you, what you have to do during the training, so there'll be a lot of things you have to to, to take on board when you go back, and uh, I, but I'm sure the players, the players will just enjoy going back there, meeting their mates, you know, and, and getting back to having the banter with the football, but I think we're in football, but certainly it's a start, and if things keep improving the way they seem to be, then we we'll just have to hope it comes back sooner rather than later. Yeah, we still would love the vaccine to be uh, available to all and sundry. But the one thing I was going to say, Tam, is something that we pointed out on this show. Uh, and I think Stephen McGowan, who was writing for the Daily Mail, your paper, Hugh, picked up on it as mm. well, which is quite simply the lower league clubs could be in some kind of mothball uh, situation because testing, tracing, you know, tracking people who might have uh, the virus and certainly any kind of a fans going to football grounds is a no-no. So I would suggest that Tam, a number of lower league clubs might still be needing some sort of bailout, might struggle to survive. And this is why Friday's meeting about blowing on budge out of the water, I think is, I think is a, 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 an act of stupidity with regards to reconstruction. Yeah, absolutely. I read uh, Stephen's remarks as well, and then I heard Keith Wynas <coughs> talking last week in the radio. Um, he painted a rather gloomy picture as well. Uh, the kind of gloomy picture for me, and uh, I, I, my apologies, I didn't hear Hugh's take on it earlier in the week, but from what I did see of the German football, I can't claim to be a fan ordinarily of German football. I don't tune into it. But the snippets that I did see, Huey, of last week, it just seemed absolutely soulless. And uh, it painted for me a rather gloomy picture of what our game could be like when it comes back. I mean, don't get me wrong, maybe the, the, me watching Mullow against St Mirren, uh, it'll be ramped up for me a thousand times more than it was tuning in to see Eintracht Frankfurt or whoever. But uh, I, I just found that quite worrying, quite scary, that it, it just did not seem real at all. And there's a wee bit of me thinks that we we should just hold off until we get the vaccine, if that is financially possible, so that we can then just open the gates as normal and let the fans in. Um, because I'd never heard until last weekend, Peter, as many people quoting the old Jock Steen legendary line about um, football being nothing without fans. And it really hit home when you did tune into some of that German stuff. I just, I just thought it was terrible, shocking. Yeah, uh, what, uh, well, uh, more than a few of my mates tried to persevere with it and, and fell asleep. I got to 3 nothing, Hugh, and then thought, oh, God, I really, I can't persevere with this. And, I, you know, you know, it's like we, we are all guilty of saying we'd love to watch football of any kind, but it was it was a hard watch with no real life there in that Westfalen Stadium. Well, it was particularly kind of poignant for me, Peter, because you know I've been to that stadium many, many occasions, mm -hmm. and every time you're in that stadium, if they were playing, if Dortmund were playing Dortmund BB, there'd be eighty-one thousand. That it. it's a sellout, just completely, and it's a, it's one of the great stadiums in the world. So it was a great poignancy about it. But the whole point about German football coming back and English Premier League football coming back is nothing to do with the fans, you know. Uh, Jockstein, you, you don't win many arguments by, by going against Jockstein, but the whole thing is uh, that in England and in the other big leagues, particularly Germany, football without the fans is still financially viable. What they've got their football back for is not to, it's not for the, the ethos of the game or the principles of the game or you know any kind of uh, uh, desire to keep going strong amid a crisis. It's so they can, so they don't have to pay broadcasters back hundreds 
hundreds of millions of pounds. That's why it's back. And, and that's why Scottish football in many ways isn't back. It won't be back for a while because uh, the, 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 whole cost of, uh, the whole cost of setting up a Bundesliga match with the, the multiple testing and the protocols in it simply isn't viable for, for, for uh, any club in Scotland at the moment. Yeah, and that's why, Ruffy, that I think some clubs in the lower leagues could be in trouble because we we are built on a fan base. We are built on fans coming through the door, buying merchandise, buying food, paying to get in uh, in the lower leagues. So if we are a long way off from that, I mean, Tom Ward on Facebook says, if we're still supposed to be social distancing, even on the relaxation of the lockdown, how can football be played? And, And that's the... The worrying part of it is we go to January and, and I don't see these clubs being able to uh, manage fans going into grounds. I think it's going to be really tough. And that's why, I mean, I like Tony Fitzpatrick. I know he wants league reconstruction, but he said hearts where they are because of their forum, you know, they deserve to go down. But I don't. Th- I think some people have lost the, the vein, Ruffy, of the issue here. It's not about saving hearts. It's about looking at what's crumbling before us. Yeah, I think you're right. Uh, I think if we're not going to see any uh, supporters coming through the gates till December, there are a lot of clubs, and quite rightly so, are going to look at the players on their books and decide what they can afford and what they can't afford. We've started seeing it uh, in the piece now. Players, Rangers have released players. There's other teams will be releasing players as well. And as we go through the weeks, it's going to get very, very embarrassed. And that's why I'm getting a wee bit fed up with Neil Doncaster. You know, every time like Ann Budge says that oh, we're going to go to court, he keeps throwing it out there. Oh, if you do that, it's going to cost all the clubs all the money and they use it all be this and use it all be that. Neil Doncaster should be telling the SPL teams, when you make the decision about re- league reconstruction, think about the people you're going to be on the streets. Think about all the players that are going to get let go for their clubs because of financial uh, restrictions. He's the guy who should be telling them we need le- reconstruction. Not telling everybody how much it costs if you go to court. Tell them how much it's going to cost all these clubs if they don't do league reconstruction. There's going to be hundreds of players out on the dole. If there's go- not going to be any football in December, clubs will just release all the players they don't, they don't really need and keep the ones that they're on, obviously the good players. But there's going to be a lot of players because we don't go to league reconstruction. If you go to league reconstruction, teams can then adapt to keeping the players on board. I think in the next two or three weeks, you'll see. I don't know what the I don't know what the figure will be, but I, I think a lot of clubs will be releasing. They possibly would have held on to. Yeah, I mean, Tom, that's the worrying part. I think we've got to try, and we've been bumping our gums about this for for easily two or three months. We've got to try and take a social responsibility here, which is, listen, we all understand there's a sky deal in place, but you can't be greedy. You've got to think about how the hell, unless government money comes in to save the lower league clubs, how the hell do we try and spread some of the money? Just if if some of the wealthier clubs have got to take a hit, fine. Think about what's happening elsewhere in this. Absolutely. I mean, the bottom line, Peter, and we keep saying it week after week after week, <coughs> is that we all want Scottish football back. And I, I would hope that there there wouldn't be fans or there wouldn't be people at the bigger clubs uh, that would basically cock a snook at uh, the smaller clubs and say, oh, well, who cares about them anyway? Because that's all part and parcel of the, the great fabric of Scottish football. Um, you know, the, the, the some of the greatest games that we remember, you think, you, you know, like Clyde, uh, famously beating Celtic when they had all the millionaires on show. We think of the frights that Rangers have had in the past to lower league clubs. We think about um, Aberdeen coming a cropper to Queen's Park. We think about Motherwell when we were riding high in a Champions League qualifier with Stuart McCall getting beaten in the cup by the second worst team in the country at the time, Albion Rovers. That's all what makes Scottish football great and gives it its real colour. We don't just want a closed shop, a, a self-preservation league where you know, 12 teams just looking after each other and to hang with the rest of them. I mean, that's just no right. But I'll tell you what, as much as we we wanted an end to all the bickering and talk of inquiries and legal action and all the rest of of it, I would still absolutely back Harps to the hilt. I think it is absolutely obscene 
that Hearts are going to be relegated first and foremost because of a global pandemic. Because a lot of folk, myself included, who acknowledge that Hearts were rotten the whole season and they were at the bottom of the league by their, by their own doing. How many of those folk, though, if push came to shove and you thought the season was going to continue from this point, how many of those folk having a pop at Hearts and saying they deserve all they get, how many of those would put the mortgage actually on Hearts getting relegated? You'd immediately get a wee wobbly thing going on, eight games to go, only four points. Jambos are going to get out of that, you know, with the resources they've got, with the fan backing, Tyne Castle, the famous atmosphere, blah, blah, blah. And I just think it's absolutely shocking. Uh, that we are in the process of demoting hearts because of the coronavirus. Terrible. Yeah, yeah, I think you're 100% correct, Tom. Um, and and it, it really came home to me last night, Hugh, when I was watching the news, and I, and I was watching the news of possibly 9,000 people losing their jobs at Rolls-Royce. And there was one guy coming out of the Rolls-Royce factory, and he said, I've been there 32 years. And I thought to myself, you know, some fans are not going to have they're not going to have money to, to, to follow football as well. That's the other aspect of this. There are real pain coming for a lot of people. Peter, uh, uh, first of all, um, first of all, I'm, if, if I notice I'm still a bit shaky and nervous, it's just that I, I really don't like angry Ruffy. Um, I... I, I <laughs> <laughs> Angry Ruffy really frightens me, and I'm glad. I'm glad uh, there's a wee bit of social distance here, and I'm sitting in Bears Den while he's sitting in Cumbernauld. I get quite frightened about that there. Um, yeah, one thing that's going to happen, Peter, and it's going to happen in every household in Scotland. Is everybody will be getting uh, the the bills out. They'll be getting the bank statement out, and they'll have a big pen, and they'll be going through the standing orders. Uh, because this is going to have an effect on everybody and uh, nobody's going to escape <clears throat> free from this. Football is in a really desperate position for a, v a variety of reasons. One of the reasons is they don't know what they're selling at the moment. There could be, there might be, it's looking, this thing has moved so quickly, but now there seems to be a general consensus that there will be no football played for fans in Scotland this year. Now imagine we said that nine weeks ago. We would have went, what? No football this year? I mean, at that time, people were still taking out feasibility studies and ending the season. People were saying, oh, the season should be played to an end. Or, you know, let's squeeze the fixtures in. So now they are actually <coughs> saying, maybe not this year. That's catastrophic. It's absolutely catastrophic for Scottish football. See the thing about league reconstruction, and I'll throw this in in league reconstruction. See if you're going in league reconstruction, is there any guarantee? See, they decided 14, 14, 14 on Friday, which is my, that I, I would settle for that. Could we be certain? In fact, we couldn't be certain that the 42 teams mentioned in them will live to fulfil that fixture. Well, that's yep. a good point, Hugh, because quite simply, I need this. They need some sort of bailout, uh, and, and you'll never believe this, Hugh. But uh, and this is a very pertinent point. Every morning, I have a meeting where we talk over what we're going to put in the show, mm. and we obviously talk about little things that we need to actually try and and put together to make sure it's as good a show as we possibly can get. And every morning, one of our producers absolutely gives me the neck for our sound, you know, for the odd little glitch that we have, because we want to try and get perfection. So I have held this mic, like Tam, rigidly here at this point, and you've got a headset on, and I keep saying to him every day, this is not me. I have got this microphone rock solid. Tam is great at it as well because Tam, while broadcasting in the BBC, absolutely understands it. You, because you're not a techno man, uh, have got, I gave you a set of headphones where I thought even you can't do anything stupid, right? But Bonzo at the far end there takes the mic, and I don't know if you can see him, I'm watching him every minute of this show. He takes the mic. He belts it off his knee, he shoves it across his crotch, and then he shiggles it about, and then next morning I get 
pelters off the, sh the producer of the show and he said oh you need to do something with your mic why not spend 500 quid in this muffler and i said it's not me it's bonzo and i'm listening to him he just he, he lays his mic down and batters it everywhere is there any chance you can hold that microphone properly all right I'll, I'll hold it i'll hold it like this so it looks <laughs> yeah, right. five minutes oh, there we go you realize how, you realize how heavy these things are I know how heavy they are, but that's why I bought it for you. Not to belt it off your kneecaps. Anyway, apart Ruffy, from when, that, Ruffy, uh, when, was the, when, when was the last time you spent £500 on a muffler? <laughs> <laughs> You're a bad man. So, yeah. Incidentally, Tom, I noticed Keith, Keith Lasley came out and said he was hoping that they, that they would actually you know, delay the European games because fans will not be able to enjoy travelling to Europe. I mean, that's another thing. Motherwell fans, everybody loves a trip to Europe, don't they? Absolutely. Um, you know, we, we were uh, blessed with a wee spell, the kind of Craig Brown stroke Stuart McCall era at the club, where I think it was six out of seven years. Uh, we managed to get uh, a wee crack at Europe, and okay, it was only invariably maybe a couple of games at a time, but it was magic. Uh, you hooked up with your pals and planes, trains, automobiles, we all managed to get to the games, and it was excellent, but a camaraderie, a good laugh, a joke, and a carry on, absolutely no expectations of uh, winning, of course, and of course, it peaked when we, I still pinch myself when I say it, we managed to get a Champions League qualifier the year that we'd finished second in the league with Stuart McCall, who played uh, Panathinaikos out in uh, Greece. And uh, it was it was magic. And again, it will be absolutely heartbreaking, Peter, uh, if we to watch Motherwell's Europa League campaign, if campaign my bears not too strong a word, but if we to watch the away game of the round that we'll probably uh, play, um, via a laptop or on your phone while sitting in the house with a drink. Um, it's going to be awful. So I would hope, again, you, know, you, you this is where it just your head wants to explode. Huey's met, talked about it earlier in terms of trying to somehow look at the football calendar for the months, the year ahead or whatever it is. I've, I've got no idea when, for example, Motherwell's Europa League games will be played. Mm -hmm. Uh, absolutely none. How will they fit in if they, they manage to get the domestic campaign up and up and running? Excuse me. It's utterly baffling. But I can understand what Keith was saying. The Motherwell players don't want to, let's say, places that we've been in the past, out in Iceland or, uh, or out in uh, uh, Romania. Um, uh, they, they don't want to be out there. Uh, and playing a game in front of zero fans. It just, you know, that would be even worse than just the domestic stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm still listening to you guys. If you see me looking left and right, it's because I'm looking at, at the, the the messages coming through on YouTube and Facebook as well. So thanks to David Mercy uh, uh, for his point on you won't see home games either in the European matches because nobody will be able to, to get to them either. It's a good point you make, David Mercy. Uh, mm. Also, Stephen Rock says, thanks, thanks for putting a shout out to my dad yesterday. We do like to mention as many people as possible uh, <coughs> and uh, give them a mention for joining us in the show and sticking with this. We really do appreciate that too. Uh, and the other thing I was going to say to you guys, this week of all weeks, I, I think it's really good and I, I'm not precious about mentioning other um, broadcasters, newspapers, the lot. Uh, I think we should all be working together and collectively pick out uh, you know, little nuggets of stories that deserve tremendous credit. Uh, and I know one of them was on the SFA website, which is Charlie Adam was talking about. This is, be, this is Mental Health Awareness Week. Um, Hugh and it's like we had Neil Lennon on talking about how he had to deal with his own problems, his own depression, his, the help that he needed with people around him. Charlie Adam uh, obviously had to deal with the death of his father and of course players up and down the country which we don't often uh, get a chance to talk about but some players can deal with abuse easily enough but there are some players where it really really gets to them and, and they can't hack it Hugh so I thought Charlie's piece on mental health on the SFA website was really good and uh, there's a little book if you have problems it's called Breathing Spaces Little Book of Brighter Days which gives you little you know stories of positivity that can help you if you are having difficulty in days and months like this. Yeah, Charlie's Charlie's uh, very open and frank uh, about his difficulties. I went down to Reading of all places just before Christmas, Peter, to interview him, and uh, we we talked long 
into the night about his career, but his, his father was central to all that, and, and we know that his father took his own life. Uh, Charlie's he's open about that because he wants to share it with us. He's rightly, he sees no shame or stigma in that. He just sees pain and loss. And uh, I don't think I've ever ended an interview, Peter, on a more poignant note than when Charlie uh, took a, uh, his phone out and, and showed me a picture of him and his father at Anfield. Charlie's father was a, a, a footballer, as we all know, and he was a, a, a very influential coach in Dundee. Uh, a lot of uh, Dundee players of Charlie's age and, uh, and uh, around that generation will know him well. And there was a picture of Charlie and his dad uh, on the turf at Anfield not long after uh, Charlie had uh, had signed uh, for Liverpool. And it was just a wonderful thing of pride in your son and pride in your father, just just beaming out and, and just showing you that, that behind those smiles and that triumph and that satisfaction, people can be really, really suffering. Um, and uh, I, I, I'm really pleased that Charlie continues to, to put that message out because, you know, uh, it might just influence one or two people, and that's all That's all it needs to influence. Yeah, that's the key to it all, is being able to talk, and I think Neil Lennon mentioned that. Here's one here from DD, uh, who's on our YouTube channel, says, Peter, could I get a shout-out uh, for my missus? Uh, we're due to have our baby, and we're going to call it Tam after Tam on the show. So there you are, Tam. Well, I, I am the father. It's, it's only fair. Mm. DD, uh, who's there, says, can you give a shout out to my wife? She's just about to have a baby and she's going to call it Tam after Tam Cowan on the show. Lovely. Lovely. I'm, I'm nearly crying here. That's delicious. Thank you. Yeah. And, and and the reaction was absolutely exhilarating from him, Hugh, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's always... But the, the, the great thing, the great thing is Ruffy, Ruffy's just, Ruffy's just froze. Ruffy's went... The, 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 look, the, the anger of Ruffy yeah. has just frozen you, you know the whole what, internet. Do you, do you know what it's Ruffy's like? Ruffy's raging. Ruffy's this. thinking, why, no. why name the baby after Tam when it's Ruffy? It's a bear. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do you know what? Do you know? <laughs> <laughs> do you know what do you know what it's like? Do you know what it's like now when you get disconnected? It's like being on who wants to be a millionaire. No, you've got to answer the four questions and who does it fast enough. Yeah, that's what it's like to get back on air when you're pressing all these buttons to go on as quick as you can. I know it's the joy it's the joy of the technology, Ruffy, to be perfectly honest with you. But you do well on it. You're the one guy that really works hard at it. We didn't think uh, we were going to be able to get you on a daily basis, but you've been absolutely magnificent. Yeah. And you, uh, listen, uh, the other thing I was going to mention to you guys, and it's quite uh, pertinent when Tam highlighted that the Scotland-Holland uh, game is going to be on the TV. Uh, when is that on, Tam, on BBC? When is it it's on? It's on uh, tomorrow night, so about 7 o'clock-ish, on BB the BBC Scotland channel. Yeah, I'm definitely going to watch it. But I, I don't know if you're going to agree with me on this. I don't think you will, Tom. Maybe some of you uh, other guys will. But uh, 30 years ago this very day, for me, one of the best World Cup songs was released by New Order oh, called aye. World in Motion. Oh, in Motion. <laughs> John Barnes. The John Barnes rap, Peter. Yes. Uh, I mean, I don't know about you, Hugh. I thought it was a fantastic song. I like New Order anyway. But... Uh, I mean, I agree totally. I think it was one of the great football songs. Uh, uh, and uh, New Order, who I love, obviously. And uh, and John Barnes at that time, such a an amazing player and such a cool guy. Um, uh, whatever happened to John Barnes? Did he go on to do anything after he played for England? Well, uh, he gets slaughtered for a 3-5-2 formation, I have to tell you. <laughs> up, at, up at Dens Park one night, Hugh, and you were probably in the heart of it. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you. I'll tell you what, Peter. I'll I'll see your world in motion. And in terms right. of you know, Scots would be accused of being too parochial at times, but mm. but far from it. As much as I loved Ali Starting Army, as much as I loved uh, We Have a Dream, the haunting ballad. I mm. think the greatest uh, World Cup song of all time uh, was another English one back home. In terms of I it being a right bum 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 and a right toe tapper, I think that was an yes. excellent song. So there you go, that'd be my number one. Well, I'm not surprised. 
Yeah, I'm not surprised, Sam, that you mentioned that because it does have that real feel of the the 1970s TV teams because they were really strong then. You know, Jason King, The Persuaders, all those type of TV teams that you you remember, um, Van der Valk, and then, of course... Uh, back home did have that 60s, 70s feel about it, Tom. And an absolute sacrilege. I, I, I refused to watch it just because of that. The yeah. new TV series of Van der Valk is using different theme music. Uh, Can you imagine that? Uh, uh, Absolutely yeah, yeah. outrageous. One of the greatest TV themes of all time. And and they, they've just binned it. Absolutely ridiculous. Listen, I, I can remember sitting in a meeting one day and they thought it would be a great idea to change the old Scott Sport theme and start to make it more 21st century. Yep. You know, and you're thinking, give me peace, just give me the trumpets and the old one and away we go. Absolutely. And trumpets you yeah. did get. <laughs> <laughs> Tom, never a, never a truer word. I had a line there, Tom, but I'm not going for it. But never, never a truer word said from you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the other thing I was going to say to you guys is uh, we're going to hear from James uh, Keatings. Uh, and also, 21st of May, just before we get to James, uh, 21st of May, 2003, Ruffy, what were you up to on the 21st of May, 2003? I don't know, but that being the night I was maybe watching a European Cup final. Well, it's funny you should say that. Let's have a look and see what was happening 2003 on the 21st of May. Celtic reached their first European final in 33 years when Martin O'Neill's team met Jose Mourinho's Porto in the UEFA Cup final in Seville in 2003. Derley put the Portuguese side in front at the end of the first half, but Henrik Larsson equalised just after the break. Nine minutes into the second half, Porto regained their advantage through Russian midfielder Eleni Chef, only to be pegged back once more by Celtic's number seven Larsson. With both sides tied at 2-2 after 90 minutes, the match moved into extra time and Celtic's chances of victory suffered a major blow with Bobo Balder's second yellow and subsequent red card, reducing the team to 10 men. In the second period of extra time, Brazilian Derle scored the winning goal to send almost 80,000 Celtic fans home with broken hearts, but many great memories on the road to Seville. So there you have it. Uh, 2.8 million travelled there if you'd listened to some of the reports but <laughs> nevertheless, nevertheless it, was a, yeah. it was a standing joke at the time but nevertheless it is one of those finals to work on Ruffy it'll live with me forever Yeah I think they were all staying in my hotel that night when I got back uh, there, was, there was thousands in the hotel but it was, it was a, a tremendous occasion as we say when we get Scottish clubs getting to finals it was the same in Manchester. Seville was just electric. The whole place was bouncing. Everybody was enjoying themselves. And uh, if you get, if you had the chance to be in the stadium, it was a wonderful sight. As we were obviously, I think you were in quite early as well, Peter, uh, to see the supporters coming in. You know, hundred by hundred, and the stadium gen just starting to fill up, and both sets of fans who were were very good uh, interacting together. And then obviously, when the stadium was absolutely full. It was what a night, you know, and uh, I don't know how the players would be able to handle it from, from the stands, you know, it was just a, an electric evening and uh, and I think everybody enjoyed themselves, apart from the Celtic boy. Yeah, strange, strange that you, you mentioned that, Hugh, it's got to be one of those strange games where even now, a lot of the players, some of the players have got mixed views on it that they can't watch the game again. I know Henrik Larsson feels that way. I spoke to uh, Johan Mialbi about it and he he doesn't like watching it. Still in Petrov says, no, I, I can watch it, he said, because mm. how many people get to a UEFA Cup final? You should feel proud. And, and I think a lot of Celtic fans look upon it as a pilgrimage that they enjoyed, even though it didn't end up the right way. Yeah, Larson's really, really strong about it, Peter. Uh, I noticed comments from him last week that he, you know he hates it. He would he would give huge chunks of what he won in his career uh, to make that result uh, different. Uh, and this is from a guy who, of course, has gone on to win the Champions League. 
Uh, so it's not as if he can say that you know he never touched the very height. So it, it's still, it's still a, a sore one. I, I was at the the function, Peter, when you were uh, when you interviewed uh, still in Petro Neil uh, Lennon and and Johan Mialbi about that night, and I thought it was fascinating. I really did the the the, the different ways that people reacted, and I think you know something. I think got Stan. I think Stylian Petrov is, is much more, so we say, soft about it because I think he believes and he knows and he's experienced the real downs in life. And I think he's now of a guy, anytime I talk to Stylian, he's a guy that tries to look on the positive side of everything, given that he was on death's door at, at, at one time. So I think that's a, that's an insight from, from, from personal experience in that one. Yeah, and Ray Finkel goes on to say, um, I, I can watch it as we uh, you know, played well, scored some good goals, and were defeated by, and this is the key point here, Tam, Jose Mourinho's team went on to win the Champions League the year after. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, the, my only lasting memory of that final, though, Peter, is I'm sure the fact, the fact uh, that myself and Stuart Cosgrove were the only two sober football fans in Scotland that night because clearly all the neutrals would have been enjoying a few drinks while watching Celtic in action. The Celtic fans, I'm guessing, would have been absolutely blittered. And even just, you know, a few stiff drinks for the Rangers fans and the off chance that at the end of the 90 minutes that they watch their their greatest rivals left in a European trophy. But me and Stuart were scheduled to go on air on Radio Scotland after the game to do a special post-match phone-in. So being the true professionals that we are, as we were watching the game unfold in the old BBC club uh, down around the back of the Botanic Gardens in Glasgow, uh, we were just sipping away at the lemonades for the entire night. And when the game finished, and uh, uh, someday in the hierarchy at BBC Radio Scotland decided in their wisdom to stick with the trophy presentation. Uh, the, the, the prize has been dished out to Porto. Um, the story was finished then. You know, the minutes the, the, the whistle went and Celtic had lost, that was that good night, or it should have been. But we stayed with this uh, presentation to Porto that seemed to last an eternity. And lo and behold, the decision, a further decision was then taken that ah, we're really overrunning here. We'll just can Stuart and Tam. So by this time, it was something like 25 to 11 at night. And we had not had one single alcoholic <laughs> beverage in an evening when a Scottish football team was in a European final. That's got to be a record. And the other thing, Tom, which I think is more important that Ruffy, I can tell because of the telepathy of Ruffy and myself, we're going to ask you now, did you still get a wedge for turning up? Yeah, well, the good thing was I think they felt so bad uh, that they did indeed still pay us uh, for that evening's ah. non-broadcast, so good on them. Yeah, absolutely. Whereas I know, Ruffy, I know you're ready to detect. <laughs> I know Peter's ready to detect three pence, four pence, five pence every time your screen freezes on this. He's got a calculator. It. But thankfully, they were more generous back in the house in days. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, and both of them, Hugh, as we know, were then taken by limousine back to their houses. <laughs> <laughs> ah, the great, ah, the great days, ah, the eh? Days. Hey, the great days. Remember the days. Yeah. But, but, Mike, Don't forget to pick Mike's... up Gary Lineker on the way. <laughs> my experience, my experience, I was the other person in Scotland not to have a drink that day, mostly on, of course, doctor's orders. And, uh, uh, but uh, I, but as, as the Herald, the Herald... The Herald decided to send out, uh, uh, <laughs> send out a, a, a recovered <coughs> drinker. They had this plan for me. You know, we know you've given up the bevy for uh, whatever it was at that time, 20 years or whatever it was at that time. Why don't you just go to every Celtic pub in Glasgow and write a nice wee colour piece about it? So I was stumbling <laughs> about sober uh, up the, up the, the Gallagher nicking in and out to Beard's Bar and trying to get a signal to send my stuff by wittering. So that was my night, Peter. Not one of the great nights of my career. I must have yeah. like but Peter, Peter will admit as well that we never got a drink either. It took us about three hours to get back to our hotel. Mm. By the time we got back to the hotel, there wasn't any drink in the hotel left. <laughs> Oh, one of the one of the worst stadiums in the world to get away from and even get a lift. I've never 
Exp- I don't know how they managed to award them the UEFA Cup final in Seville. It was terrible, Ruffy, just trying to get away from that place. It yeah. was unbelievable, wasn't it? Yeah, I think the only the only good side of it was, and I know Celtic will beat that, but the, the good humour of the fans leaving the stadium for miles and miles. They were still celebrating that they were they had a club that had got to a final and they enjoyed themselves thoroughly for the whole night. Yeah, absolutely. Listen, um, if there are Hibs fans who have, and I, the reason why I held off for a wee while on this, you is because Hibs TV, I think, was showing the game from three o'clock uh, all the way through. So Pete, Hibs fans would get to wallow in it for as long as mm. possible um, today of all days when they were transmitting it today on Hibs TV. Um, so earlier today, I caught up with a man who uh, was part of that squad, came on as a substitute, enjoyed the fact that they had ended 114 years of pain. James Keatings is talking about Hibs 3, Rangers 2. Well, I'm delighted to say our special guest today is former Hibs midfielder James Keatings. James, 21st of May, 2016. It will live long in the memory of every Hibby. Yeah, it sure will. Obviously, as a player as well, it's, um, it's a moment in my career which um, I've not topped yet and might not top. So it's a, a memory for me. It, it's um, This day comes around every year. And, you look back and see the pictures and the videos and it's a wonderful moment. What do you remember about the build-up to it? Did you sense the pressure that was going on the players? Was there pressure on the players because the fans just wanted to end that way 114 years? Yeah, it was obviously in the build-up to the game. You heard every fan talking about it. You've seen it all over so- social media and and stuff for how how big the game was, and obviously you were coming up against Rangers, so were, were favourites. So at the time, but um, it was it was huge. Like, it, you don't I, for me, I didn't realise how how big it was until after the game, and you seen the supporters and the scenes after it and before it. Yeah, you're, you're taking comments off people and you try to take it in and think how much it's going to mean to them if, if it happens and then when it did happen it shows the, the scenes after it were, were crazy You need to have a strong mentality uh, to try and beat Rangers at any time so Hibs going into that match had a manager who obviously had that strength of character how important do you think Alan Stubbs was to the whole process? It was massive um, like it was the changing room as well was it was a unique changing room we had. Um, I've never experienced it. I've never been in a changing room um, like it before that and after it. It's, um, we were a really tight bunch of players. Um, we were all in it together. And um, I think it fed through it. It showed the mentality of the lot of the team and, and um, it showed in the cup final. Were you scared of Rangers when you looked at the, the team that Mark Warburton had selected for that day? I believed in the team we had. I believe we, the players we had as well. Um, it was weird going into the game. I, I felt confident. I thought on the day, because I had the nerves before the game, and obviously I started on the bench, um, had the butterflies and stuff. So a great feeling, a um, unique feeling. And um, throughout the game, I, even when it went to 2 1, I was coming on, I, I still believed then like, we, were, we were going to win it. I mean, you got the perfect start. I mean, Anthony Stokes was just, is what you call the dream loan signing because there was a boy who was uh, gallus, confident, and boy, could he finish. Yeah, he's, he showed through the years how, how good a player he was um, and still is. Um, he's he's um, also showed at Celtic his capabilities. Just going through a, a period of his, his career where he had a low and he came to, came to Hibs and set at the big stage and he showed up and and done his stuff early doors, it's, it's off to an absolute flyer. And, um, and myself, obviously, getting a second as well, it was to show you a top, top player. Yeah, and, and picking up on your point, you said there that even when you come on, you were 2 1 down. Uh, I mean, what was the feeling like on the bench and on the you know on the team when you reflect on it when Halliday hit that screamer? Because it was a great goal, and, and many people thought, well, the game's going to follow a certain course, but not the Hibs players. Um, during the game, obviously, we, we got off the flyer, so it was we were confident. It was the be- best po- possible start. 
Um, so it just bred confidence, but obviously Rangers got back into it and then Hardy scoring. As he scored, I was at the half railing ready to come on. So I watched the, the goal go straight in. Thought to myself, oh, that's obviously not the greatest moment to be coming on again, but I just stuck to my guns. I was come on and, and trying to influence the game and, and do my part. And um, I knew the boys still had it in them. As I said, the, the changing room mentality we had in there and um, just kept fought, fighting on. and. As as you, as it shows at the end, like took it into the later minutes and and um, created history. Yeah, I mean the the atmosphere was incredible. Uh, the two goals, the equaliser and the eventual winner, followed a similar pattern. I mean, Liam Henderson was just you know inspired as a Hibs player, um, but of course perhaps fitting. You know, Stokes gets a second, but the captain leads by example to win it. Yeah, Hendo's deliveries were, were phenomenal, so they were, and um, credit to, to Stokes and Dave, they, they went and met them and, and put them in the back of the net, but two similar goals and, and two crucial, massive and unbelievable moments in, in football, so obviously you can uh, can uh, put it on a better day to, to meet that ball in the last few minutes of a game, a cup final, so many years, and They've done it, and it's just surreal. Yeah, I remember the fourth official holding up the board for four additional minutes to be added on. When the ball hits the back of the net at 3-2, are you just thinking, Poof, no way back, that's it? I was trying to get my breath out. Obviously, when Dave scored, I ran <laughs> the opposite way. And um, I just get, people always ask me why I've done it. I, I get totally lost in the moment. Um just one of the things that as a as a kid growing up, you're you're watching your heroes lift the Scottish Cup, win these cup finals and you never think it's gonna be you. So for me, I, I look back and people ask me like, where did I go? And I just ran the total opposite way, celebrate it and then I had to run the opposite side of the pitch to get Dave and the rest of the team back to half railing and obviously we had a couple of more minutes and I was absolutely knackered to be honest. I was um blown blown out my pants so was but um it was it was unbelievable, um, and obviously a few minutes they, they kind of dragged. We thought you were playing another half an hour, but after the whistle went, it was it was unbelievable. Yeah, it wasn't exactly the ideal end with the fans, but it would have been nice to be able to go and parade that cup for <laughs> what hours on that park. That would have been something special. But just lifting that cup with the medal, uh, I mean, th do the players sense now that you will be forever, uh, you know, in the history books and at countless dinners for years to come to celebrate that moment? Yeah, obviously, it's, we get remind, reminded of it. Um, so often, so it's it's a moment in in history. Obviously, it was 114 years, and um, it was a long time waiting for a lot of people, and we managed to do it. So I look forward to obviously still talk to most of the boys and and that team. So hopefully one day we'll we'll be able to meet up and and talk about the these memories. Yeah, you mentioned the spirit in that dressing room. There were a few characters. I mean, Jason Cummings, um, it's fair to say many people would think he wasn't the full shilling, but you need a, a wee bit of madness in there, don't you? Every, everyone was, was a part of it in the changing room. That, that was one of the good things about that changing room. It was the, like, the older boys, experienced boys, and as soon as they came in, and it was just a laugh and a joke. But once the ball came out or we were in the gym, it was serious and... Everybody was in it together. There wasn't any like, clicks in the change room. It was everyone there together, pushing each other and helping each other whenever somebody took a knock. And that was the the big part of that change room. Who was your favourite player in the team that you absolutely enjoyed playing against? When you looked at it, and you thought, "Ah, this is this is a joy." <sighs> so many. John McGinn, obviously. Look what he's doing now. He's Top top player, Dylan McGee. You could go through the, the full team. Obviously, Jason, Jason scoring week in week out every half chance. His finishing was brilliant. Um, and Kevin Thompson. Kevin Thompson was was massive for me when he came in. Um, he helped just mentally wise. He was um, always take on now. Um, he told me told me aside and told me to be a more selfish player and instead of passing, shoot. And um, there was, there was so many. 
top players. You you go to the back to Dylan McGregor, Dave Gray, the leaders. Um, you could go throughout the team like pure professionals, Louis Stevenson. The team was um, the changing room was was full of characters and and um, professionals, and it was a, a great mix, and it was a, a great changing room. I always look back and, and think about Lou Stevenson, who's dedicated his life to the club. That, for me, is the, the, the richest reward. It is guys like him who live and breathe him that you feel a, a kind of a special feeling for. Is that fair? Yeah, definitely. Obviously, Lou has been there for his whole career, so it was, it was massive for him. He, he believes that club, so he's, he's, that was the biggest moment for him to, to obviously get that, that medal around his neck and it was a, a, a great moment for him and then a, a very pleasing moment for myself to see him achieve that in his career there. Yeah, um, just, just sum up for me finally, uh, James, the parade, the cup, seeing all those fans, how special was that? Surreal. Um, so I stay, obviously, in this taking round, you, you start seeing the pictures again and the memories, they don't they don't leave you. I never, I never thought it was going to be the way it was, um, obviously, the parade and for the week after, and the hangover after that, that was, <laughs> it was, it was um, a ridiculous, ridiculous, but unbelievable time um, for every player and and um, every fan at the club and everybody associated at the club at that point. Yeah, tell me your old dad's got that shirt frame. Tell me it's up in a wall somewhere safe. Ah, it's hid away, so it is. It's, it's in the cupboard to put away. <laughs> James, it's been an absolute joy sharing the memory with you of that special day. Uh, thank you very much for joining us and stay safe and well. Yeah, great to hear from uh, James Keating there. Um, a wonderful day. He will be dining out on it, Ruffy, for the next oh, 30, 40 years easily. Yeah, I think so. I think any any time that Hibs have got something to, to celebrate, they'll be the guys to bring back. They'll be remembered forever and a day. I'm sure there'll be photographs uh, Easter Road uh, as we speak, and uh, they'll be welcomed, uh, right, every one of them. Uh, any time I, would, I went to Easter Road, and quite rightly so. Yeah, uh, and Tom, James Keatings did really well there. He couldn't quite uh, think about another phrase when he was tired in the game, so he just said, I was breathing out <laughs> of my pants, which is a new one on Yeah, me. he clearly knew that he was broadcasting, and that was it. Good on him, good on him. But no, the, the, the guys who won that, it was absolutely phenomenal. None of them, none of them, of course, who, who brought that famous old trophy back to Leith, none of them will ever have to pay for a massage again. It's uh, their heroes in that neck of the woods. And uh, <laughs> the, what, I, what, I found, what I found quite interesting there, Peter, and I bet you've all noticed this over the past few weeks now, uh, obviously James Keaton's there in dire need of a haircut, and it's amazing how different uh, well-kent personalities are beginning to look. I mean, Scott Brown, when he popped uh, up again through the week when Celtic were awarded the, the title, uh, he, he actually to look twice to think, is that Scott Brown? Because the hair had grown back in. And I had another double take in the back pages of this morning's papers, uh, Callum <coughs> McGregor. Callum McGregor to me looked totally different. Uh, with the hair having really come in so there must be so many of them like that now that are just absolutely choking uh, for a haircut have you, have you been doing in at home, Ruffy? you seem to be quite tidy there uh, No, I had uh, Maggie uh, had a quick uh, scissors out the other day and just, just cut away to her heart's consent but uh, there's nothing you can do with my hair you know, you can't make a mess it just falls into the same style so it doesn't matter how much you cut off yeah, I think uh, you maybe kind of uh, uh, exaggerated that point here, Ruffy. You can't actually make a mess of it. It's on BBC at 7 o'clock tomorrow night. Uh, it's called <laughs> Scotland against <laughs> Holland, to be perfectly honest with you. I'll just say, I'll think we'll... I'll just think... <laughs> I'll just think there, if Tom takes his hat off, he's modelling in the same colour as that Doug. That's a fair shout. I, I'm, I'm really. Yeah. I, I, honestly, my my hats that I've taken to wear uh, are a necessity now because my hair is the proverbial horse couch, you know. And Hughie as well, I'm noticing all the extra that hair. I nearly did they recognise uh, your nostrils? That's, that's it. <laughs> I'm actually, I'm, what, I'm, what I'm doing, Tam? I'm going to do a Bobby Charlton with my nostrils. I'm going to do a bobby oh, go for it. Just, just, just draw them out over a nice, nice big comb over. 
That I've got to ask you guys, and I don't know, I don't know if you've watched it. You know how you're you're scouring every channel to watch something a wee bit different. Sometimes in the morning when you get up, if you go to like BT Sport Three, they've got what they call um, the classic big match from ITV in the no, early seventies, yeah. which which uh, which is Brian Moore presenting it. And I thought Brian Moore was a great presenter as a commentator. Um, and sadly, I think no longer with us. But I, I thought he was no. a great commentator. But the game, the games that they have on, uh, they had. I think his name was Cyril Knowles, who used to play yeah. for Tottenham. With the big Bobby Charlton, he didn't care. Bobby clearly didn't care. There were some people who just did not care about the comb over, Ruffy. They were quite happy to go for it. Yeah. Uh, there was another one I can remember, a boy. I think he played. What was his name? Is it Coates? Ralph Coates. Ralph, Ralph, Ralph Coates. Coates. Ralph Coates. He, he had yeah. one of them as well. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and Tom. Uh, yeah. yeah. But Jim. Jim McLean with the old comb yeah, over. As you, as you can see what happens Aye, is Ruffy's, if it goes Ruffy's over a certain time, Ruffy. Uh, yeah, well, uh, I was just about uh, to say, Tom, once it, once it gets over a certain time, uh, Ruffy's thinking, I'll just uh, batter the Wi-Fi here and it'll go off. Um, and of course, one that you would know, Tom, <laughs> Henry Hall. <laughs> oh, Henry Hall. Aye, that's yes. uh, Stuart Cosgrove's absolute pin-up. Um, Henry Hall, famous for the comb-over um, as well. It was uh, ah, it was a fantastic look, and I, I think it was as well, because in the off chance that you were ever going to get uh, a bit of fun poked in your direction if you had one of those comb-overs, you tended to find, Huey, that the guys that had them could play a bit. And I wonder if Absolutely. that was all part of the cunning plan. They thought, right, I've got a napper like this. It is dead easy <laughs> for folk to extract to you, Ryan. So I better get my finger out and make sure I do the bizzo in the park. So whether it was Bobby Charlton, Drew Jarvie, uh, we Archie oh. Gemmel, you know, they, they could they could all do it. So I think we need Absolutely. to, instead of these modern day players, get in for their clinical laser surgery to get a carpet put in their head. I think you should allow them to go bald gracefully, <laughs> indulge in a comb over, and I think we'll see the very best in them. Yeah, Lindsay Bartlett has said another cracker that, and he was, as Tam pointed out, a great player, Drew Jarvie. No, oh, yeah. great, great. Yep. Yeah. Played for Airdrie, played for Aberdeen as well. Uh, really good player. Uh, listen, just before we go, lads, I, I think I want to mention this again because some people have actually said to me, could you uh, mention the book again? But obviously we, we highlighted Charlie Adam and that you know great little interview over on the SFA channel. Uh, Breathing Space is the, I think, the company that's made the book Little Book of Brighter Days. It's uh, It offers ways to practice positivity uh, for better mental health. And it just might help when you look and read some of the little tips that it gives you. So Breathing Spaces, um, Little <laughs> Book of Brighter Days, because in this week of all weeks, uh, mental health awareness um, I think every one of us knows that if you have problems, if you have depression and you, you have uh, just basically difficulties in this isolation, then get on the phone or reach out to somebody, tell them you're having problems. Uh, I think I heard Lee Hendry saying a, a problem shared is a problem halved. Uh, and I think that's the best way to sum it up. So um, it, when you need help, maybe books, maybe calling someone is... Uh, the ideal advice I can offer you on this one. So, with that in mind, I think Casper has been absolutely sensational, Tam, today. Uh, he's been absolutely He's superb. been great. A very well-behaved wee Doug. So, when we get back up the stair, I'm going to get the jar of Bovril out as a treat. Okay. Well, there you are. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, who who would have... <laughs> I know I know I know you. He looks... I know. He's, I know. He's, he's oh yeah, it's, it's, it's he hasn't come out of his... It's a football show. It's a football we need a bother. Uh, okay, but yes, your um... brains out of the gutter. <laughs> all I want to all I want to know is can Casper send an invoice? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Don't give him ideas, you. Don't Aye. give him ideas. Well, if, if, if Harry Redknapp's Duncan, so can I. So you better believe it. <laughs> <laughs> ah, that's the best way to leave it. Thanks to Casper. Thanks to Tam. Thanks to Hugh and Robbie. Bye. And, uh, don't forget to like, share and follow our Facebook page if you can. And also, if you get a chance, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Have a great night.
Expect the best used car deals guaranteed. Visit arnoldclark.com.